Hey, Lorraine, thank you very much for joining me on the Work in Progress podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Dean. My pleasure to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And this is a transatlantic podcast because you're over in Canada, that's right? That's correct. Where, where are you in Canada? Because I, I, I guess, you know, being in the UK, we always think the UK is a big place because when it's all we know. But then Canada and the US is, is vast, isn't it? So, so I'm right smack dab basically in the middle of Canada in a province called Ontario. And I am right at the top of the Great Lake Superior in a city called Thunder Bay. Great Lake Superior? Yeah, there's five Great Lakes. If you, if you ever look at the map of Canada, you'll see there's like one here, one here, and then one kind of hanging down, and then two, two little ones underneath. So I'm at the very top of the Great Lake Superior, which is the biggest of the Great Lakes. Well, by the name, it, it sounds huge. Just, just literally by it the is. Great it Lake is. Superior. Yes, it is. And, and being British and watching the movies, I'm assuming that it freezes over nicely in the winter and everyone plays ice hockey on it, right? Um, I don't think it totally freezes. I think maybe sections of it do really, really close to the shore where it's shallow, but it's, it's, so that no, I, I, would, I would, I would say it's sort of like akin to the ocean where it, like it wouldn't freeze. <laughs> big. Yeah, it might just be like, say the British version of what it's like in Canada, because we always watch the movies, see, and all, all we think of in Canada is that it just freezes over and everyone plays ice hockey on the lakes. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And where, where in the UK exactly are you? I'm just slightly north of London in uh, the county of Hertfordshire. So I'm in a place called St. Albans. Oh, okay. I just, yeah, yeah I wasn't, wasn't sure. It's a stone I knew, I knew you were in the UK. I just wasn't sure exactly where. Yeah. So just, just outside London. So I guess we've spoken a few times now. Um, you know, we, we was almost going straight into the chat there, but for the people that have never heard of Lorraine regularly, how would you describe yourself? Well, the short version would be that I am a certified English teacher who is now running her own word-based business called Wording Well, where I do writing, editing, and author assistant services. So basically, I'm an author as well, and I help other be people become authors. So with my love of, of words, writing and editing, I have used those skills and turned them into a service for others. And yeah, I just created a business out of it. So, which is pretty fantastic. I mean, to be able to work doing something you love is, you know, it's, it's everybody's dream, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And on that, let's deep dive straight into the book that you've written is Note to Hope. And it's, it's yeah. quite, quite a journey and quite a story, and, it, and it's very personal to you, I understand. It sure is. Here's the, uh, the cover of it. It's got a rainbow on it because I love rainbows. And um, basically, I ended up writing this book in, in response to all of the feedback that I got from a blog post I had written about my suicide attempt because I've, I've led a pretty rocky life. And... Uh, Basically, I was raped when I was 14 years old. I was a virgin, and my whole belief system was shattered. I fell into a deep depression. I turned to drugs, drinking, um, you know, eating, quitting school, um, fell into promiscuity, thinking that, um, you know, if I gave guys sex, they'd give me love, things like that. Um, my twisted teenage thinking, I didn't know how to cope with what had happened to me so I ended up trying to commit suicide as well and uh, years later I when I started blogging I wrote a blog post about that and called what I want to kill myself what do I do because um, I you know I had suffered from depression and suicidal thoughts for years afterwards and you know I threw counseling I went through lots and lots of counseling and then I learned some different strategies and techniques for coping on my own as well. And I included them all in this book because um, the blog posts, like I noticed at one point I was getting over 500 people a day reading it. And I thought, holy smokes, like I can't believe there's that many people out there that are so depressed and so, you know, feeling so down that they're just thinking of ending their life. And 
so I ended up, you know, writing that book and um, in it. So I've, I've included my personal story about how I overcame the subtitle is how I overcame my suicidal thoughts and how you can too. I've also included four other people's experiences um, true stories, uh, just with changed names, obviously, to, you know, protect, protect them. Um, and then all of the strategies and techniques as well as a, a little, um, I'm just flipping through here. Uh, at the end of each chapter, I've included uh, what I call a thought and action exercise. So there's like a little spot to, I don't know how well you can see this, but okay. um, for people we'll to write people in, um, based on, you know, what they've sort of learned in that chapter and how it applies to their life. So, um, yeah, so there's, there's a question, you know, some cases like here, this one here has a chart uh, to fill in. Um, yeah, so it's, it's basically um, a book that anyone can use to improve their life if they want to just learn to live a happier life. But it's particularly helpful for people who are depressed or you know just not feeling happy with their life in some way so it's you know even though it's it says how I overcame my suicidal thoughts you don't have to be suicidal to read the book obviously or for it to use the strategies in it to help you and um, to prove that I've actually made chapters eight and nine free on wordingwell.com uh, chapter eight is called change your mindset by using positive affirmations. And chapter nine is use meditation, the law of attraction and visualization um, to change your life. So I can give you the links if you want to put them in the, the show notes. Yeah, or whatever we'll, make, after. We'll, make we'll make sure people can find that book for, for sure. So yeah, it's on Amazon. So from nope to hope, I mean, if, as long as you just google that like it'll it'll come up yeah well we'll make sure people are directed towards it and they can they can find that resource so firstly like huge respect and huge kudos to you for having the strength to share your story because you know what a powerful story i know there's a lot of people suffering especially this year when it's been quite a, a crazy year and there's a lot of people mm -hmm. maybe who've never struggled with mental health in the past all of a sudden find themselves in a bit of a a deep hole maybe not quite as extreme as some of the the, the past that you've shared but extreme enough to feel terrible and then but see that's that's the whole thing dean is we want to avoid people from getting to that point absolutely. of extreme despair so if we can teach people how to cope with just the everyday stressors of life in um you know in, in an effective way right away then yeah. they won't progress to that point where you know things fall apart so much that they just want to end their life and and actually end their lives like so many people like suicides you know i don't know what, what the statistics are but i know it's pretty high yeah like a lot of people kill themselves and to quote phil donahue <laughs> suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem and that right there is what most people who are feeling that level of despair and hopelessness don't remember in that moment. They don't remember that it's just a, a, a temporary problem. Like these problems are going to eventually go away. These feelings are eventually going to go away, right? Like, like say you have a fight with somebody, right? Like say your wife you're bickering back and forth and you know this happens this happens and then you're like you know so mad you both walk out you both slam the doors and you take some time apart but yet you know a few hours later after you've had time to calm down you end up going back you talk things out you hug kiss make up everything's fine right yeah. so those <laughs> but those hours earlier when you were at each other's throats you you feel like oh this is you know so awful and it's never going to end and, but it does it's a temporary thing right so if we can sort of compare and you can't really compare those kinds of you know feelings of anger to the feelings of hopelessness and despair um but you you know just just to use that as an analogy um so when you're in that place of 
you know, you feel worthless and you feel like, you know, just everything negative, you know, you don't, whatever's happening, you're frustrated at work, you're frustrated with your relationships, you're frustrated with your own self. Maybe, you know, you're disappointed in yourself for, you know, not sticking to your workout schedule or, you know, to whatever. Um, or something's happened to you, you know, where you've been abused and you, you don't know how to cope with that trauma. Um, you know, and that's what it was in my case. Like I was sexually abused and I had no one to turn to. I felt like I couldn't tell anyone. And so I didn't, I didn't tell anyone for like, I think it was something like eight years. Um, I was actually going to be one of my questions, if, if you're okay with that, actually, because the book is titled yeah. From Nope to Hope. And the key part that I'm taking away from, from your words is it's all about starting off with that hope, having that um, belief and that expectation that things can get better, if that makes sense. And in its worst case scenario, it's the lack of hope, which kind of gets people to that point where they think, well, why do I bother? And mm -hmm. if, if we look at your story, for instance, you know, you were violated and abused at such a young age for us for, for someone like myself who's never had that experience and I was able to grow up in a different way I'm almost thinking well at what point did you learn to have hope again if that makes sense so I'm interested to know if, if, if you're okay with it at what point did you realize actually there is a future there is a better way things can look rosier if that makes sense because at 14 it's such a young age, you know, and, you, and there's so much you haven't experienced yet. And if at that age you're already starting to doubt the world, especially when you don't, you, you never felt safe at that age, at an age where really, you know, the people around you, your family and the community at large had almost like an obligation to protect you because you're at a very young, impressionable age. And then uh, when you didn't have that protection and you feel that exposed, how do you get back to hope? Well, that's an, that's an interesting question. And um, for me specifically, um, I, at the age of 17, got pregnant and at the age of 18, had my son and became a single mom. And so I wanted to give my son a better life than what I figure I had up, at, you know, up to that point. Um, so really, it was my son that basically stopped me from killing myself every time I felt suicidal after that, because I knew that if I did, if I wasn't there anymore, he wouldn't have anybody. And then where would he be? So I considered his needs above my own. Not that, you know, dying was a need, but you know what I mean? Like, I just thought, you know, if something happened to me, where's my son going to be? What's going to happen to him? And I, and I couldn't do that to him. I couldn't leave him motherless. And so I realized like, okay, I need to, I need to figure out how to deal with my crap and move on so that I can still always be here for him. Um, most people though, aren't, um, aren't in that same situation like they you know and and not necessarily they don't even necessarily have to have suffered a, abuse as a young child they could have it you know as an adult you know like you get sometimes you get into a relationship and it ends up turning toxic you know for whatever reason whether the person's you know drinking or doing drugs or being physically abusive or, or mentally abusive or all of the above or a combination of whatever like every single person's situation is different right? I mean, we're all different human beings. We all have our own experiences. And even though our experiences are different, the feelings that we end up having are the same, right? That's what connects us. You know, we, we all feel love. We all feel hatred. We all feel, you know, compat well, hopefully we all feel compassion for others. And, you know, all of these different things that, you know, unite us as a as a people, as a society, we all feel the same kind of emotions. And sometimes identifying those emotions is really hard to do. And actually, I was just, uh, as I was looking through that, that one chart was, was from 
um, identifying, chapter seven is identify your emotions and release negativity from your life. So some people have a hard time figuring out what they're feeling. They just know that they hate what they're feeling. And so that, um, that, that chapter um, teaches you about how to identify emotions and then how to use um, like a release method. So here, for example, that chart I was showing you, the emotion would be listed here and then the release method to use, uh, whatever one is the most appropriate or that you wanna try using, you could list it here. And then that way you can go back and say, okay, you know what? I'm feeling like really frustrated and angry right now. How do I release that? Um, and I mean, it could be uh, for anger. What I find especially helpful is for me personally, um, yelling always makes me feel better. Yelling and screaming, um, slamming doors, um, you know, throwing something like something like say say a brick to the ground like because you don't want to hurt anybody you don't want to damage anything um you just have to get that pent up anger out of you right um so there's punch bag in the garage <laughs> exactly a lot of guys tend to end up turning to yeah hitting the punching bag and you know releasing that you know that rush of adrenaline um you know things like that like i find um i actually end up getting really productive when I'm angry. I'll, you know, I'll start doing the dishes, I'll, you know, just because I got to keep busy, busy, busy. And you have to release that, that surge of adrenaline, all that energy out. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, that's using uh, anger for an example, but there's, there's other different, you know, other emotion. Like if you're talking about um, here, let me just quickly find a really good example here. Um, so, There's an emotion wheel that I'm not sure if you've ever come across, but there's actually a couple of them and I've included uh, an example, two examples in, oh, nice. in my book here that are, yeah, this one's printed in color, so it's super nice. I, love, I told you I love rainbow, so anything that's got a rainbow <laughs> on it, I love it. Um, but this helps you to identify the emotions. So, you know, on one side of the, um, the spectrum, we were talking about aggressiveness. On the opposite side, we're talking awe. And um, you know disapproval, remorse, and you go all around, and you know serenity and joy to you know to boredom, to disgust, to apprehension. Like there's so many different things. And once you've identified your emotion, you can figure out like how to deal with it. And so there's a whole list of. So we talked about you know screaming and physically venting. Crying is another. Some people cry just to feel better. Some people write. Some people talk. Some people uh, meditate or pray. Um, some people do all of the above. Um, detach yourself. Um, and that's something I've actually had to do recently. I, uh, someone in my life was negatively impacting me. And I just had to remove myself from the situation for a few days just to, just to, get away and mentally reset myself and make me feel better. So like when I talk about these things, this is not something that like I just wrote and referred to. This is actually something I use like in my life, like even to this day um, to, to help me. Um, well, this is, this is partly why I'm so interested in the material in it, because like I've not known you very long, but we've spoken quite a few times recently mm -hmm. and you know, we were speaking about your business, about all your goals, your ambitions, your plans, and you're such a eloquent speaker, you know, you're such a jovial person, that it wasn't until you then started saying, oh, so what's the book about? And then it's like, oh, and I was like, wow. Like, I just couldn't, I, I struggled to imagine that that's where you came from, having known you now, if that makes sense. You've come. Uh, yeah, yeah, you must, it, you must it totally does. An um, amazingly long way that even even during this podcast, you're describing your journey, and there's and there's like a little bit in my brain thinking, is she talking about herself or someone she knows? Because how could this be the same person? If that makes sense. So these these tools must be really powerful. They they are, and what what has helped me the most and first of all thank you for complimenting me on my speaking ability i appreciate that it's always nice to get a compliment and and i just want to thank you for that um what 
<laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. What's helped me the most? Okay, so the positive affirmations is one of the free chapters that I mentioned on my website. That's actually something I never learned in counseling. It's something I discovered on my own about seven years ago. Um, just through my research of, you know, doing self-help stuff. I'm always looking, looking to improve myself even now. And um, not just, you know, well, as a person, obviously, for sure, but also um, for my business and, you know, business growth and things like that. So the personal development field and the self-help field is, you know, it really strikes a chord with me. And when I came across these positive affirmations, I, I took the time to learn about them. And I thought, you know, okay, well, let's give this a try. Even though I had never, because they sound, they honestly, they sounded too good to be true, you know. Like, so if you've never heard about them, I'm going to just briefly explain what they are. So positive affirmations are statements that you say to yourself every day until they sink into your subconscious and you actually start believing them. Because the interesting thing about, and, and they don't have to be true statements. That's the cool thing about it. So you don't have to believe them initially. So say, for example, um, you tell yourself, I am a beautiful person. Like say, you know, you're like, oh, I'm fat and I'm ugly and this and that and blah, blah, blah. Right. Because that's what I, you know, the negative self-talk that I've told myself over the years many times, you know, and I, and I still am fat, but I'm not ugly. And I finally realized that because I tell myself I'm beautiful and I can change my weight. So I would tell myself, you know, I'm beautiful, um, you know, I'm skilled, I'm talented. All of these things, yes, are true. But then I would tell myself things that weren't true. Like I am a published author. That was one of my affirmations long before I even started writing a book. I am a published author. Because when you tell yourself things that are positive, your brain, the interesting thing about your brain is that your subconscious has no idea what's true and what's false. It'll just take what it's told and accept it as truth, whether it's a lie or whether it is true. And that's why positive affirmations work so well and are so effective in changing your mindset and changing your thoughts because they sink into your subconscious and your subconscious believes them. And then they rise to your consciousness and they change your thoughts. So what's really cool is that they work fast. And like when I first started, like I said, I was really skeptical when I first heard about these. I thought, oh yeah, right. Like this sounds like a miracle, you know, cure, right? So then I thought, okay, wait a second. Even if they do sound too good to be true, what have you got to lose by trying them? Well, yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Like when you feel like you've lost everything, like there's nothing left to lose, right? So I thought, okay, I'm going to try these. And I tried them and they worked. And, you know, for a couple of minutes out of your day, I recommend first thing when you wake up, because then it'll set your mind right for the day. Um, you know, reading like 10, 15, 20 statements, either to yourself or out loud. Some people do it in front of the mirror. Some people, like, I just have a list that I just read, um, you know, while I'm having, like, my morning tea and cigarette. Like, that's just my, my thing. Um, other people, you know, will say them in front of the mirror. But it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you do it. So in as little as about, like, a week, you'll notice your thought patterns start to change without even touching your positive affirmations throughout the day you'll just be like you'll just get like these positive thoughts like and you'll feel good and it's like oh hey pretty cool like they're working and so um the mistake that a lot of people make is once they're feeling really good they stop using them um i'm guilty of that as well but uh you know if you keep using them you will end up being a happy, positive person. So like you say, you look at me and you think, oh, Lorraine's never had, you know, any problems. She comes across as so happy and, you know, sure of herself and confident and in control of everything. Um, well, yeah, now I do, but you didn't know the old me. 
the one who lived before this book, before all these strategies. Um, that person was a completely different person. That person spent the day in bed. That person got up only to eat or to go to the bathroom. That person thought that having a shower in a day was a huge accomplishment. That's how depressed I was. Like, I didn't want to do anything. I, I, and I literally did the least amount possible that I could actually do. And there were days where like, you know, like honestly, like where I said having a shower was like the highlight of my day. It was like, oh, if I can accomplish that today, I've done something. And, you know, I, I don't like going back to those memories. Because they are super hard to deal with. Well, they were clearly very but, real. But, you know, it's, it's kind of good, though, to, you know, every now and then sort of revisit them because then I can look at where I am now and say, hey, you know what? You've come a long way. Oh. And, and I forget that, you know? Like now in my daily life, I do forget exactly how far I've come. And um, it's a good reminder to, to be like, okay, so, you know, now that I've, I've gotten to this point, um, what's next, right? And this is why I feel like it's almost my responsibility to help other people who are feeling the way I'm feeling because I know how awful those feelings can be. I know how soul crushing and devastating they are. I know how badly they can affect you in your daily life to the point where you don't want to do anything. You don't even get dressed. You don't get out of bed. You just do anything to escape, whether it's drugs, whether it's drinking, whether it's eating, whether it's sleeping, whether it's, you know, whatever it is. And those were the, you know, initial coping strategies that I used. And they were not helping me, um, you know. And finally, it came to the point where, you know, I thought, okay, I, I have to get counseling and I have to figure out like, I have to get someone to teach me how to, quote, unquote, be normal. And, um, and it, it's a tough process for a lot of people to go through. Well, it's a tough process, first of all, to even get counseling for many people. Um, some people simply just can't afford it. Uh, some the waiting lists are so long sometimes it's just hard to get in I mean whatever the obstacles there are there's it's really tough to get that kind of counseling and that's why I wanted to offer people an alternative by you know reading my book and and having that resource at their disposal it's it's you know and it's not super expensive I don't know I think it's something like 20 bucks on Amazon for the print book and five bucks for the ebook or something. It's not like it's super affordable. Anybody can have this. There's even two chapters free on my website. Um, so I wanted people to be able to have that help um, easily, readily available to them. Um, I, think the, I think the key thing for a lot of people is the, the fact that it's such a real story. Now, my, my understanding of counseling, you know, I've, I've never required it to that level, but they do a lot of study, they work really hard, and they got some, you know, they do some fantastic work. However, one of the challenges that I've found with friends and people that I've known and people I've been aware of is when they get to a dark place, they they may look at the counselor and go, What do you know? You don't know how I feel. Like you went to school, you got a bit of paper, you passed an exam, you got a certificate. Yeah, I felt that same way about my You don't know how I feel, if that makes sense. And I, I love what you shared about affirmations because 
the, the harsh reality of life and the way the brain works is you kind of get what you believe. Mm -hmm. And once you kind of get that, once you understand it, you just want to go out and tell everyone. You go, right, if you change what you believe, the whole world changes. Yes. But then yes. it's very hard to share that with someone who, who's not getting it, if that makes sense. So someone's in a very dark place. They're not uh -huh. really feeling it. And they go, oh, OK, Dean. Uh, you and Lorraine seem to tell me that if I think the world's sunshine and rainbows, all of a sudden it's going to cheer up. Well, have you seen my life? If that makes sense. And and sometimes when people come with all their, you know, credentials and their um, academic qualifications, it's like, well, you came from mummy and daddy's money, put you through university and, and you've had a lovely, cushy little life. What can you tell me about, you know, raising, rising from a dark place you know, to, a, to a good future? But What's extremely powerful about real stories is when someone says, I've been in that place. I know how it feels. Mm -hmm. And you made the, you, you said earlier, you kind of hope that everyone's got compassion. Well, once you've experienced that, of course, you have compassion for the next person. Now you go, right, I've been in that place. I've been in that hole. I know how it feels. Mm -hmm. I don't like to go back there. So I can imagine that you don't like being there. Um, how about you take my hand and you follow a strategy that worked for me? Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, that's a story that gives people hope. And, that, and that's what I like about the title, From Note to Hope. Because I do think, and again, you know, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I do think it's that hope which is the first bit. It's that, it's that point where they go, it could be better. I actually, I actually believe now it could be better. And I actually believe that there's a way and a path and a process that I can follow and I can achieve it, not just a yeah. thing, but something that's proven. And I yeah, think, and and then, and that's why that's exactly right. Like why true stories are so powerful because you can you know or or share hearing about different people who have been there and done that because and then you know have grown to to do something more with their life. Hmm. Um, now, most people when they're in that type of situation where they're feeling that you know despair and hopelessness and worthlessness all they want to do is just feel better they don't care about being successful they don't care about you know money they don't care about like whatever they just want those feelings of pain to end that's what they don't realize they don't realize they don't want their life to end they just want those feelings to end and to get there, they, they have to, like, they have to take a first step themselves. And that's where a lot of people sort of end up struggling because no one likes to admit that they need help. Even though they want it, they don't want to admit it because then they think it's a sign of weakness. Now, here's something really interesting. My friend Maxwell Ivy, who I recently introduced you to, uh, is a blind man. He's a blogger. He's an author. He's a podcaster. He's, uh, you know, someone who went from 512 pounds to 250. He's like got an amazing journey. He's uh, so inspirational and he's blind and he runs all these businesses and coaching and things like that. He's just absolutely incredible. Now, something that Max told me when it comes to help, and this is so interesting, you're going to love it. If you don't ask for help, you're actually robbing the other person of the opportunity to feel good for helping you. Because mm -hmm. people like helping other people right? Like you see a little old lady with a walker or, or with a cane. She's trying to cross a busy intersection and like, she might not make it. Like, are you not going to step in if you're right there and offer, you know, to help her like get the rest of the way across the street? Or if someone's, you know, bleeding on the sidewalk and crying because they can't get up, are you not going to call 911 to get them an ambulance? Like people like to help other people. Like those are extreme cases, but just in general, like, you know, we have a feeling like of, you know, like that's what makes us human. Like we'd like to help other people. We might not have a lot, say for example, um, and this is, this is actually what I love about 
people in third world countries. I went down to the Dominican Republic about four, four and a half years ago. And, you know, coming from Canada, you know, first world country, and going down to a third world country where they, they're so poor, they, ha they don't have a lot. They will still give you what they have. They'll give you the only shirt off their back to, if it makes, you know, you helping you feel better. Like they will just kindest people ever. And that's the kind of people I think, you know, I, I, I wish all of, you know, humanity was like, like we like helping other people. So when Max told me about this viewpoint of his, um, cause his father always used to say, you know, he's got another saying, if you don't ask, they can't say yes. So he sort of just, you know, elaborated on that and said, you know, like, if you don't ask for help, you're actually robbing the other person of the opportunity to, 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 to help you, you know, which will make them feel good. So asking for help, if you look at it from that point of view, it's like everybody should be asking for help because then everybody will get helped and everybody will feel better because the helper will feel good for helping the helpy and the helpy will feel good for getting the help. And then in return, we'll want to pay it forward. Like it's just, you know, a beautiful exactly. thing all the way around. Exactly. So that's, that's another thing that I think is really important for people to understand is, you know, when you're, when you're feeling horrible, don't feel horrible alone. Go talk to somebody. Even just talking to somebody and, you know, venting, you know, talking about your problems will help you. And you don't even have to phrase it like, say, I need help. Just say, I need someone to talk to or, you know, like whatever. And, and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just so many different things that you can do. And a lot of people aren't really aware of that. And so, I mean, that's, you know, that's why I come and I do podcasts like yours and, I, you know, I, I've shared my story, like I've been on, I don't know how many podcasts now, like a few dozen for sure. Um, at one point, uh, last year and the year before I was on at least, I made it a mission to do something every single month. So I was on either, you know, uh, one or two podcasts every single month that ended up being published or I, you know, I was doing, um, also in addition to doing, you know, guest posts and writing and, you know, things like that. Um, just trying to do anything that I can conceivably do to help get the word out that help is out there. Strategies are out there that you can use to feel better. I think many of us often forget how loved we are as well. Like we all get to that place where we think no one will understand. I'm on my own. I'm isolated. I'm lonely. No one's there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, but then whenever people have been in that situation and people have found out in retrospect, they've always said, well, if I'd have known, I could have helped them. I wanted to help them. And I think whenever I put my hand up and asked for help, I've always been a bit shocked actually at how many people were there. And it's one of those things that I kind of learned. I'm a proud person. I'm a stubborn person. And I've gone through periods in my life where I didn't put my hand up and, you know, I suffered. Thankfully, nothing too serious, but I suffered for it, you know, and now I'm, I'm a bit older and I'm a bit less sort of uh, caring on my image <laughs> and, and my, my reputation. I, I, I get to the point where I put my hand up and I say, look, guys, uh, can you help? And I, it never fails to surprise me how many people are there, actually, if you ask, mm -hmm. you, know, like, you know, and people want to help. They really do. So that uh, quote that you mentioned from your friend, well, I mean, it makes absolute sense. People actually want to help. And then like, yeah. you say, I, I never really think of it like that because I always think of asking for help as a selfish thing, like a lot of people do. But people who love you, they really want to be able to put their arm around you sometimes and just say, you know what, it's going to be okay. And they get something out of that. And I think that, I, I think you're right. People do have compassion. They want to. And, it, and it's not only just the people that love you. Like I've helped complete strangers. Hmm. Like I've gone on Facebook and just, you know, like I'll see all kinds of different things on there and somebody will, you know, be like, okay, well, I, I don't know what to do or, or, you know, something or even in a discussion group or whatever. And then I'll just jump in and, and offer my, 
my opinion um, and do whatever I can, whether it's, you know, giving them a link to a resource or, you know, ad advising them on, you know, providing a suggestion of what they could do. Um, Cause I know I tend to, I, I sometimes tend to come across as like a bit of a bossy person and like always wanting to tell people what to do. And I don't, and I know that that's a quality in me that I, it's good to want to help, but the way I tend to, you know, help, I have to like refine it a little bit to not come across as like a, a know-it-all or something like that. Like, like I want to come because I'm coming from a place of genuine sincerity. Like I sincerely want to help you. And here are some suggestions. So rather than saying, well, do this, just say, you know what? here's a couple of things that you could do. Um, you know, here's three things. This number one thing worked really well for me. This one worked really well for my friend. Um, here's another alternative. Like you, you can pick whatever you think is going to help you. And, and just by doing that, you know, they'll be like, oh, I never thought about it that way. Or, oh, you know what? That's a really great idea. Thank you for sharing it. And it's like, it's my pleasure. You know, I'm happy to help. And it makes uh, sense that sometimes you have to be a little bit delicate, I guess, because like you said, like the answers sometimes are actually quite simple, but you just mm -hmm. have to be receptive and in the appropriate state to, to, to take them, if that makes sense. And yes. I guess from your experience, when you've seen it, you've seen the, the success, you, you get to a point where you know what they need, um, but you can't always just tell them to do that. <laughs> you're like, right. I know and, it's going to work for you, but then if I just tell you, you're going to resist. So you're trying to sort of get them to a receptive state where they, you know, they might actually take it on board. And when things are a bit raw, like people don't just take it straight away. Oh, affirmations. Great. Thanks. I'll, I'll try that one. You know what I mean? Like, like that's going to save the day. But as they get round to it, they think actually, you know, it's got to be worth a shot. And I know one of my favorite quotes, which I embody is always, you know, it costs nothing to believe in yourself and everything not to. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to understand what that really meant. But I say it all the time now, it just costs nothing to believe in yourself, but it costs you everything not to. So sometimes when people are giving a bit of resistance, I say, well, why not give it a try? It costs nothing to believe in yourself, but it's going to cost you everything not to. Yeah. And that's sort of similar to um, another quote. I can't, I don't know who said it, but it goes something like um, it deals about with, the, with your regret, like, and, and pain, like, uh, and it sort of comes from like the, the mindset of, of working out, like if you want to lose weight or something, like choose your pain, like what's going to happen if you do, what's going to happen if you don't. Both are painful, but in different ways. It's sort of tied into regret. Like, are you going to regret something, you know, to five years from now? Like, or are you going to be happy with yourself for making this decision? Like both are going to be painful, but what kind of pain are, do you want sort of thing, Absolutely. right? Yeah, and, and it's like, really, you know, that that applies basically to everybody. And, and it sort of ties into success, too, because if you think, um, you know, and the positive affirmations, like you asked me, you know, like earlier, how how did I go from like this horrible, depressed person to the happy person you see before you today? And I used, you know, all these strategies, but I also used um, the I, once I changed my mindset using the positive affirmations, I built on that and I revised my affirmations, like the better my life got. So, you know, here's a couple of examples of affirmations I use today. Um, a successful oh, business woman. Actually, if you had any favorites. Yeah. A successful business woman lives inside me. And today that woman's running my business. Wow. Um, I love that one. Cause on the days that I, I, I'm working, I, I say that and I'm like, boom, like I am pumped up. I am on top of it. I am in charge. I am, you know, full of confidence and ready to like get things done. And, you know, just telling yourself that one simple statement and believing it and you get to the point of belief by repetition. So even if you don't believe it initially, you will believe it as it sinks into your subconscious. Yeah. And that's why I love, you know, and that's why I love the positive affirmations because like they're so powerful. Um, 
but it, honestly, it's, it's how it works, isn't it? Because, you know, I think a lot of us think in terms of the goal as in the end point, as in once I get the, the goal, then I am that person. But the truth is, the goal comes after you become that person. <laughs> you know, the, the reward, if that makes sense. You, it, the delivery of the, the goal, whatever it was, is mm -hmm. actually just the um, c confirmation that you are that person now. Exactly. Like, so, so some general affirmations that everybody can say. Um, Today is going to be a good day. I am a wonderful person. I am confident and strong. I can do anything I set my mind to. Doors of opportunity are constantly open for me. I feel strong, excited, passionate, and powerful. Today I'm concentrating on meeting my goals. Today I'm concentrating on moving my life forward. Um, there are no limits to what I can achieve. I am awesome. I am willing to attract all that I desire beginning here and now. Um, you know, and they just go on and on. You know, I deserve all good things. I deserve happiness and success. I am motivated. I'm in control of my life and destiny. Like blah, blah, blah. Like there, but these are true. And, you know, once you tell them to be yourself enough, like you will believe them. And then great things will start happening to you. Um, for me, uh, there was other things that like you can use, like the visualization is another strategy that you can use in conjunction with, with the affirmations where you sort of, um, and meditating goes hand in hand in the, the law of attraction. So that's chapter nine. That's another free chapter. So basically like if you, you know, think to yourself, okay, here's my vision of what I want to have happen or, you know, and it could be anything. Um, for me, it was taking a trip. Like I've never seen a real palm tree in my life. Okay. Up until like I said, four years ago when I went to that trip down to the Dominican Republic and I, and I saw all these beautiful palm trees. Prior to that, I had constantly visualized in myself my, my happy place, which was near, uh, on a beach, um, you know, near, near some water, under the sun. Um, in my vision, it was like lying on a hammock and reading a book because, you know, lazy and relaxing, right? Love it. Here so in the, the sun. I feel like I'm and <laughs> Exactly. And, and over time, I thought, okay, you know, like, how am I going to go from like my current reality where I am now, you know? And this was at the time, it was like in the middle of winter in Thunder Bay, Ontario, right? Snow everywhere, freezing cold weather is like, minus 30 celsius like i'm talking really cold and i had taken my nephew to the swimming pool and there was a palm tree painted on the wall and in the little kitty pool which was sort of like a whirlpool like, like heated water so i was laying in that while he was off playing with a couple of boys he had met swimming they were doing some games or whatever and i'm just sitting there looking at this palm tree thinking oh yeah you know wouldn't it be nice to have this this nice warmth, like be actually on a beach. And three days later, my brother sent me a message on Facebook saying that he and his girlfriend were going down to the Dominican Republic for a week. And did I want to go? Like my brother's never invited me on a trip anywhere before. Okay. He's traveled many times, whatever, but he knew that I had just got my passport because he was the one who was like my, I think it's called the guarantor, like a co-signer, like, like somebody who vouches for you who has to have a passport. One of the rules when you fill out the application. So anyways, I had gotten that done, you know, and, and about six weeks prior to that. So I received my passport. He knew I had it. He sent me this message just after me doing this vis visualization yet again. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like, should I go on this trip? So he sent me the link to the resort. I looked it all up. It had great reviews, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, yeah, you know what? I got to go on this trip. It's only one week. And yeah, it's going to, you know, it's going to be a couple thousand bucks, but you know what? Just paid off all my credit cards and why the hell not? You know, this is an opportunity. And I thought I have to go. So I went and honestly, it was like the best week of my life. It totally re refreshed me, re re 
rejuvenated me. So many things happened. I actually ended up writing um, an article later after, like months after I had gotten back, like 12 reasons why you need to take your dream vacation now. Um, and I, Ryan Biddulph, uh, the he's known as the blogger from paradise. Um, his site is bloggingfromparadise.com. He and I are good friends and, and I had often, you know, I always read his blog posts and everything. And he's always like posting pictures of, you know, beaches and palm trees and beautiful places that he's gone to. And so that kind of, you know, set it in my mind, like, Hey, I want to do that too. Like he just like goes Island hopping basically and gets paid to do this. Um, yeah. And, and everybody, you know, looks up to him and loves him for it and, you know, wants to live that lifestyle and he's actually doing it. And after seeing all these pictures, uh, you know, that he's posted, I thought, you know, like, I haven't even seen a palm tree in real life. Like I really go on, you know, I really want to do that. And so, yeah. So when my brother ended up, you know, inviting me on that trip, I thought, oh my God, I have to go. And, and it was, oh, it was just amazing. It was so nice. I didn't take any technology with me except for my phone so I could take pictures and videos. Um, I unplugged from the internet for a, a week. No laptop, no nothing. It was awesome. <laughs> so awesome. Um, it reminds me of the yeah. first time I did a vision board, actually, because it's crazy, really, because I did a vision board, and it I'll tell you the story, but it worked. And then I thought, I was so amazed that it worked, but I didn't like do another vision board for about 10 years. And I'm like, how does that make any sense how you do something that works so well and then you don't repeat it? But, but that's exactly what happened. But the first vision board I ever did was with my wife to get married. We started planning oh. out a dream wedding and we decided that we, we wanted to go and get married in the sun abroad. And nice. bear, bearing in mind, I've never left Europe, you know, and it's the only <laughs> time I've ever left Europe was to go abroad and get married. So we oh, planning wow. out all these pictures, getting all the, you know, palm trees, beaches, nice tropical islands. And in the end, we went in the travel agents and we were sort of, I'm in an R and we ended up getting married in Antigua. And, oh, nice. You know, it was, it was a glorious wedding. It was a dream wedding. <gasps> we had a, it was like the honeymoon all rolled into one. And no um, I, I, I'm very smug and happy that I made the right choices. It was fantastic. <sighs> but then when we got home, we had kind of a repeat experience of the guy in The Secret where we pulled up the, the um, I don't know if you've seen him in The Secret, where he pulls out the vision board and he's explaining to his son that he had a vision board for his house. And it turns out he was in the house. But he didn't realise at the time, but he was actually living in the house that was on his vision board. Oh. Um, and it was the first time he realised, was when he was showing his son in retrospect. And oh, wow, cool. I, I kind of did it with a vision board. We picked it up and we looked at it and we thought, that's, where, that's the actual pavilion where we got married. And that is the swimming pool. And then there was one particular photograph which was taken from a bedroom, you know, to look at the, the suite. And mm -hmm. out the back out the back of the shot, you could see out the window in the view. And I remember looking at it thinking, that bed, the view, that's the exact room we stayed in. And and when we turned up to the the resort they found out that we were getting married and they upgraded us because it was quite quiet. They goes, Oh, you know, because you're like a honeymoon couple, we, we've upgraded your suite. So we didn't even kind of book that suite, if that makes sense. Oh, wow. We that's kind of upgraded so cool. When we got there. And then when it was nice. only when we got back, we started looking at the photos. It's like, Oh my word. I mean, literally everything was on the vision board and don't ask that's, me. I didn't, that's awesome. You know, the, I, the first thing I should have done was create another vision board, right? But then, like, it was quite a few years later before I did it again. But like, I remember just being completely like dumbstruck because you see it in the movies, you see it on telly, you see it in a blog, and you think, yeah, all right. You know, what I mean, he, he just manifested his own reality by painting a picture on the wall. But but, that, but you know what? That's that's so up. so true. You do. You have that power. Like you have that power in you to change your own life and to create and manifest whatever you want like you seriously do and i, I never like i i never really believed that um until i started you know doing more research and learning more and more about it and you know once i you know once i was able to like manifest this trip right I mean, I had taken, yeah, I had taken some steps. I had to get my passport and I, you know, did these visualization exercises beforehand. But, um, you know, it, 
once you're able to do that and actually see it come true, that's when you really start believing like, oh yeah, this totally, this totally works, you know, and, and it does. And so after that, um, I started, I, I actually hadn't created my vision boards either. And, uh, last year I, I searched online for a whole bunch of different pictures of things I wanted on my vision board. And I ended up creating not just one, but three. So I have one in my bedroom and then I have a, I have two that's um, actually they're behind me on the wall. You can see ah, that. I was going to ask if it was those, but I thought I was Yeah, that's exactly what they are. And um, oh. so basically I took bristle board. Um, I took sheets of bristle board. I cut out, I, pr I printed off pictures, just random pictures from the internet that I liked, um, printed them off, cut them out, glued them on. I included um, quotes, motivational quotes. So I printed some of those out, cut them out and glued them on too. And then once everything was glued on, I had them laminated. So I brought them and had them laminated. Then I put them up on the wall. So creating it like actually took a lot of time. Um, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, I got to <laughs> stop looking at it. <laughs> but yeah, so these, so I put one in my bedroom and I put two in my office here and since creating these vision boards, I have to tell you a little story here because on some of the pictures are um, my uh, of an office because at the time I actually didn't have an office in my apartment. I just, you know, I had a desk set up where I, you know, I had an office area where I worked, but I didn't have one specific room dedicated as an office. After creating this vision board and, and looking at all these, I decided um, back in March, just when COVID hit, uh, I decided I was going to do renovations. <laughs> it just happened to be around that time. Hey, and I thought, hey, you know, why not? I mean, I'm home anyways, right? Like, I, I might as well make my home even better. And so I, I ended up, yeah, so I painted, my, I painted my second bedroom because my son's not moving back with me ever. I already know that he's grown and on his own. Um, so I painted the bedroom. I bought, you know, some, some decorative stuff to put up. I got a new carpet um, and I, and I put all my office stuff in it as well as like my painting desk and all my painting stuff too. So everything is now in this one specific room and, and I'm absolutely thrilled with it. Like, um, it's yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just so happy. So because of the vision board that, you know, it, it was like in the back of my mind, like, okay, you can do this, you can do this, you can make it come true. And like, yeah, yeah it's going to be some work and, but you know what, you got friends that'll help you and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, there we go. Got, got a, got a new office. Not only did I do my office, I actually renovated my kitchen. I was waiting for you to say you got three extensions of conservatory. <laughs> I didn't have any kitchens on my vision board, but you know what? My kitchen has, has been in need of painting and, uh, and everything. And it's, and it's a really small kitchen. I actually um, ended up getting uh, new floor tiles. And paint, so I painted everything, washed and clean, painted everything. Then I got the new floor tiles. And then I also got this stuff to um, redo the kitchen countertops. It's like it was a do-it-yourself job. Like my landlords had nothing to do with it, but... Um, I took pictures of, throughout the whole entire process of every single penny that I spent putting into this apartment. And you know what? They reimbursed me the full amount. Oh, wow. Well, you've I was so surprised because that's how good of a job. And my kitchen now looks fantastic. I absolutely just love it. And my bathroom also got redone. I got a new floor in there and then I redecorated everything. Well, they put no the new you floor in. No wonder addictive. You'll have one in every room soon. <laughs> so, I mean, out of, you know, because I mean, I just... Well, you know, you're not going to stop making them, are you? No, I'm, I'm going to keep on going. Like, so the next, so the next thing on, on my thing is like, I don't have my own vehicle. I got a couple of pictures of cars on my vision board. Um, just so I can keep, you know, that in mind, like save, save for a vehicle, save for a vehicle. Um, so that's the only thing really that, uh, that hasn't really come true yet. Um, but I'm working on it. Um, there's always so, something to come. There's, there's always yeah, you know, so, um, but the swimming, like I got lots of pictures of swimming pools and stuff. 
and because I like swimming. And so I actually ended up getting um, not a membership, but I bought a, a pass book of, so, of, of these like tickets at the, the, the huge Olympic swimming pool um, complex that we have here. It's called the Canada Games Complex. Um, so, and they have like an Olympic sized swimming pool. They had the Canada Games here at one year, I think it was 1980. Um, like, yeah. <laughs> many many years ago many years ago i think i was like i was nine at the time <laughs> yeah so anyway uh <laughs> yeah, 90s, was it? <laughs> yeah so it, so i ended up because i like swimming so i thought oh well you know and i and i want to lose weight and i want to work out and blah 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 so i ended up buying the swimming pass book and going swimming um about once a week or so or once every two weeks um until of course they closed down because of you know covid and everything else so yeah so that part sucks but um you know the vision boards yeah they really help and i highly recommend using them as well because that's another really good strategy to you know to, to grow yourself well you clearly put some great tips together and they clearly work so and i know me and you we could probably talk forever and ever and ever because i know we're in our flow now aren't we and this is our yeah. project but it's probably a good place to wrap it up so sounds good everyone listening they want to get their mitts on that book it's from nope to hope by lorraine regularly and your main website is wordinwell.com which is where you Correct. offer all your services to help other people get their book out full editing is it all the editing services is there any other yeah things? there's there's writing editing um the cool thing that I, I actually didn't talk about is that anybody can become an author these days anybody can put a book up on amazon anybody it is so simple to do it, like super simple. Um, on my homepage of my website, there is a link that shows you the the step by step process for putting a book out there. If you need help with that, I can definitely help you. But I've put together a guide for free that you can access for free. Nothing downloaded, no email address necessary or nothing. Just it's accessible on the internet. Um, so go take a look at that too because. Uh, anyone can put a book up on Amazon. Super easy to do it. There's lots of benefits for having a book out there, uh, especially if you're a business owner. Um, you know, it adds instant credibility credibility to you. Um, it's another area where you can make passive income. Um, there, there's just oh, there's just so much. Like like yeah, you're right, Dean. We could talk forever. So you know what? I'll just <laughs> We're in the shut zone. up now. <laughs> So but yeah, I mean, wordingwell.com, that's where I help help people with authors, author stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's Sorry. been a blast. It always is. We, we catch up and I, I do have fun catching up. And it's just amazing how you can take such a, a hard story, but it, it, it's so positive because of the progression and, and where it ends, if that makes sense. And well, yeah, because and I mean, you, like the way you've kind of ironed out that it's not something that's just a one off. It's not unique. I mean, this is what everybody can have. Like this is available to all. So, you know, get to know these principles and, and learn what's going on with, with, with the mindset and the way the world works. Mm -hmm. So definitely I'm going to I'm going to say good night, though. I think it's just about afternoon for you, if you isn't it? It's it's yeah, it's evening or pre evening. <laughs> pre -evening. As Sheldon like, from the Big Bang Theory would say it's pre evening. <laughs> yeah, it's like five 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 thirteen PM here. So yeah. it's uh it's just about time yeah. to pour a glass of wine and enjoy the evening in your in your hammock under the oh, under the palm tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really happy that our recording ended up working out well for us today. We haven't yeah. had a glitch yet. We tried so. the other day for anyone listening to the end and, and it didn't quite work out. We had technical issues. Oh, we certainly did. So I'm glad it glad it worked out really well for us today. <laughs> No. Anyways, thanks for having me, Dean. I appreciate um, all of your support and, um, you know, willingness to help me, you know, help other people. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's just been a blast. Thank you so much. Brilliant. It's, it's been a pleasure and I hope we catch up again soon. Yes, we will for sure.